Hello, and welcome to the Consulting Specifying Engineer webcast, IEQ, Planning for a Variable Future, sponsored by TRAIN. I'm your moderator, Amara Rasgis, and I'm happy to be here today on behalf of Consulting Specifying Engineer and CFE Media and Technology. Here are some tips so that you can get the most from today's webcast. If you're experiencing issues with your slides or with the audio, refresh your browser or click on the Refresh Media button directly under the presenter's photo. You can control the volume of this webcast by adjusting the volume on your own computer or by adjusting the volume on the webcast platform. If you are having technical problems with the audio or slide presentation, click on the question mark at the top right corner of your screen to access a list of system checks to try before contacting an online technician. If you do need an online technician, please type a message into the ask a question box and someone will get back to you as quickly as possible. Individual technical questions will be answered in the answered questions box. Type questions for the speakers in the ask a question box on the left side of your screen. The live Q&A session will begin in about 45 minutes. Today's webcast is being recorded and you'll receive an email in about a week with the link to the on-demand event. To download a certificate of completion and a PDF copy of this presentation, use the event resources tab on the left side of your screen. These documents will also be available with the on-demand version of this webcast. Now we'll hear from the sponsor of today's event, Train. At the conclusion of the video, you may experience a few seconds of silence to compensate for varied internet speeds. Please stay tuned for today's presentation. You can't see humidity, but it can impact your health. You can't see air quality, but it can either be helpful or harmful. And you can't see energy, but it can either save you money or cost you. At TRAIN, we help you see, analyze, and interpret the invisible so you can have greater confidence in your building's performance. Ready for now, resilient for tomorrow. TRAIN. All right, thank you. And let me introduce today's presenters, Jeff Wiseman, Scott Huffmaster, and Ron Cosby. Scott Huffmaster is TRAIN's Healthy Spaces Sales Leader, responsible for leading TRAIN's indoor environmental quality efforts for the United States and Canada. This includes TRAIN's WellSphere Initiative, a holistic approach to building wellness that cultivates healthier indoor spaces by enhancing air quality, lighting, and acoustics. Scott helps customers achieve customized healthy spaces while aligning with TRAIN's strategic mission and objectives. Scott holds a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from the University of Texas. Ron Cosby is the thermal systems and technology leader at TRAIN. He's responsible for overseeing the company's technological developments for commercial HVAC products and services. This includes applying his expertise to indoor air quality to assess commercial air system components and offerings to ensure proper humidity levels, advanced ventilation, and air cleaning for customers. He earned his bachelor's degree in aeronautical and astronautical engineering from Purdue University and then went on to earn his master's in mechanical engineering from Purdue University. Jeff Wiseman, is the indoor air quality portfolio leader for TRAIN, leading the development and execution of TRAIN's product growth strategy, investment, priorities, and strategic practices for developing and launching best-in-class indoor air quality offerings to address indoor environmental challenges now and beyond this pandemic. Jeff has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of South Florida and an MBA from Xavier University's Williams College of Business. All right, Jeff, you're up first. Let's get started. All right, thank you, Amar. Um, and thank you for having us here today to, to present at this webinar. So what we're gonna go through today, uh, we're gonna start off in a high level, we'll talk through indoor environmental quality or IEQ. 
um, and really some of the shifting expectations we're seeing with buildings. Um, then we'll move into looking at the different technologies, right? Evaluating some traditional technologies and then looking at some new emerging technologies um, that we are seeing come out into the market. And then we'll wrap it up with uh, considerations, you know, for designing for variability. So when we think about, you know, indoor environmental quality or IEQ, there's really four main components for um, IEQ. So we'll start at the top left, thermal comfort. I think this is one we're all pretty familiar with, right? Am I hot, am I cold? Uh, really controlling the temperature and humidity within a space um, really has been our core competency, you know, here at Train, and uh, I'm sure it's something that, that this team here is very familiar with. Uh, if we move to the top right and talk about lighting, this is really around the visual comfort uh, in the space. I think we, we probably have all gone into spaces that may have the real bright white lights, right? You almost need to put your sunglasses back on uh, or spaces that are very dimly lit, right? And that can really impact um, you know, your, your overall mood and, and, and well-being in a space. And so uh, getting the lighting right can be important. There are new studies uh, coming out now that indicate, you know, lighting can, can help improve productivity in a space. Uh, really looking at changing intensity and colors uh, of the lighting to align with your circadian rhythm and, and so on. So uh, it can be a big factor. Um, moving to the bottom right, we talk about acoustics. Um, obviously, this is the noise in the space. We know a lot of noise is bad, right? It can be extremely distracting and even um, you know, can temporarily or permanently damage hearing if it's, if it's too loud. Uh, and on the other end, if it's too quiet, that can also um, not be optimal for the space. And so the right level uh, of noise in the space, um, you know, can be good um, and, and definitely enhances the, uh, the, the comfort or the experience within the space. And then the, the final piece, and where we'll spend probably most of our time is indoor air quality. Uh, obviously, a lot of interest on IAQ here with the pandemic. I think a lot of people are getting more familiar with what's in the air, right? CO2 and VOCs and other contaminants. Um, that absolutely can play a big piece in, in the health of your building or the health of the occupants in your building and, and the well-being. Um, when looking at IEQ, I think it's really important to, to first note, right, there's not a single solution or single technology uh, that can be implemented everywhere to improve IEQ, right? Every building is unique. Obviously, you know, different regions have different factors to consider. Uh, think about the West Coast, right? Um, dealing with seasonal uh, wildfire smoke, right? It's gonna be a thing that we're gonna have to deal with in the future. Um, that's gonna require a unique solution compared to say maybe the upper Midwest that has extremely low humidity levels in the wintertime. Uh, that'll be something else uh, unique that you need to deal with. So it's important to, to really understand the space um, and understand the factors uh, impacting your IEQ. Um, this this is, is true for you know existing buildings and also as you're designing new buildings, really understanding the factors um, of the new building you're you're, you're designing, right? What's the space going to be used for, and, and so on. Once you understand uh, the space and, and some of the factors and limitations that are in place, then you can start to put together what a solution may look like. Uh, we call that our our, our mitigate um, step, right? So. High, you know, high VOCs or, you know, could result in one uh, solution. Humidity can result in other solutions, right? It's really putting together that system to improve the overall IEQ in the space. And then the, the last step, which is a very important step, uh, we call is, is the, the manage phase. So once you've incorporated all of these solutions, you want to validate what you've done is actually achieving the goals you set. Um, the manage phase is also very important to, to allowing you to optimize the system. So as conditions change, uh, you're able to go back in and, and tweak, you know, the system, make some adjustments so it continues to be uh, an, an optimal system. The managed phase also allows you to start looking at uh, balancing the efficacy or the, uh, the, uh, the safety of the space with energy um, intensity, right? So we can start to adjust systems to account for when certain technologies are needed uh, and start to turn some stuff off when, when it's not. Um, IEQ as a whole is definitely something that... Uh, you know, we see is a changing demand for buildings. Occupants or visitors to spaces want to know that the space they're going into is a, uh, you know, a good, clean, healthy space, right? And, and so much so that um, some buildings, you know, are able to start to differentiate their, uh, their space versus others to some of these new third-party um, accreditation cert or certifications, I guess, that are available, right? I'm highlighting two here. Uh, that's the International Well Building Institute, and they've got their, their well certification, also the FitWell. Um, IEQ plays an important role in both of these. It doesn't account for all of the points. We'll show that here in a second, but it is a component 
um, that's considered when looking at these different well certifications or fit well certifications. Um, again, you know, when, when you go through these, these different certifications, you can achieve them different ways. Uh, wells a little more rigorous, right? You have to have a, a, an accredited or an AP, a well AP certified person come in and uh, uh, evaluate your space and some of the improvements you've made to get credits for it. Um, there's a fee associated with it. Uh, as there is with the fit well, there's a program that you that you must uh, go through to get the accreditation. Um, a smaller fee, but if you're able to use this accreditation to differentiate, differentiate your space, you should be able to command a premium for your building and also much more interest in folks wanting to use your space. Um, I talked about indoor environmental quality being a component of both of those certifications. This is just a, a breakdown of different areas that's considered when looking at either well or fit well. I won't go through uh, all of these programs, but let's just take a look at the well version two on the left-hand side. Uh, there's roughly, we show 178 points here. This slide's a little bit old. That might be, um, the, the number of points might've changed a bit, but overall IEQ can impact roughly 20% of the total points. And I think it's worth noting um, to get certified, you don't have to achieve 100% of the points. It's just a, a percentage of the points needed for the different level, levels of certification. So if it's bronze, silver, gold, so on. Um, when, when taking a look at, you know, the level that you want to achieve or your customer or your owner wants to achieve, IEQ can end up being a significant portion of getting those points. So a building that's designed well, um, you know, can, can get you 50, 60, 70% of the way to getting your well certification. So with that, I think I'll hand it over to Ron to, uh, to talk through some of the um, expect expectations and changes in, uh, in buildings. Thanks, Jeff. So as Jeff discussed, there's, first of all, good morning, good afternoon. Um, but as Jeff discussed, there's more and more building certifications coming out that incorporate IEQ. That's become even more true here in the last year and a half as the pen, with the pandemic as people start designing their buildings for enhanced air quality for occupant needs, people in this audience specifically. So this, coupled with some of the things that you're seeing now as people move to hybrid and work from home models, it's giving building occupants uh, a choice as to where they work. And, and this has caused employers such as our company, other companies, that you have to compete for talent based upon what your building offerings may have, especially around IEQ. So if it's not the building type that they like, they may look at other opportunities, other employment opportunities. So overall, that building environment that gets created or gets enhanced can improve the overall building's intrinsic value based upon how it meets the owner's or the occupant needs in that space. Um, so we saw this slide earlier. Uh, what we're gonna do though, is we're gonna focus a little bit more on indoor air quality in these slides, but you're still gonna have to recognize that the other aspects of IEQ are still important and they may potentially be impacted by what you do from an IEQ solution standpoint. So keep that in mind. So going forward, how do you work with a building owner to meet the needs for something that you can't see? And at the same time, you're trying to make people still comfortable in that, in, in that space. So are there mechanisms to know that the equipment efforts are, are, are working? And how do you share that with the building owner or occupants? So that building value can be impacted on how well it meets the demand of the occupants, but then you have to manage that variability that also could be, that could exist in the space because of different building uses. So with that said, um, we've been focusing our IAQ mitigation around four key pillars that you see here. So we've, divi we've divided those pillars for mitigation into four. The first is dilution, then exhaust, then contain and clean. And now each of these pillars can be used to mitigate risk within a building. And Jeff talked about each building is gonna be different. So you may have different mitigation strategies based upon the type of building and what it can do or what may already exist for that building in place. And depending on what type of contaminant you may want to uh, go after. So we're gonna talk a little bit more on dilution here on the next slide, but just to start dilutions effectively, just bringing in outside air to reduce the overall concentration of whatever contaminant you're trying to remove. Um, going hand in hand though with dilution is exhaust. It's conservation of mass. You bring something in, something's gotta go out. So, but exhaust can be as simple as providing fans for exhausting air out of rooms. 
but especially when you get to tighter rooms where they may have less less air movement, such as restrooms or kitchens. Um, I bring up restrooms because every time now in the pandemic, uh, since the first three months of the pandemic, every time I walk into a restroom, my ears perk up listening for an exhaust fan. Um, so you want to ensure that small spaces that may have restricted airflow, you put in a, an exhaust fan and you turn that exhaust fan on to ensure that you could get contaminants removed out of that space. So diving back to dilution though, um, you really want to mitigate the potential risk. So do that, you, you go to move to where at least you use the ASHRAE 62.1 design minimum for outdoor airflow into the spaces that are occupied. Um, in pandemic mode, so maybe in a criti critical pandemic mode, you want to disable demand controlled ventilation. Um, that way ventilation is as on as much as possible. So you get as much outside air as possible. So you're always trying to pull in more outside air with this dilution mitigation. And then finally, depending upon the capabilities of your system uh, and your controls, you can implement pre or post purge occupancy sequences that can help flush that outdoor space either at the end of the day or prior to the beginning of the day so that if you have any potential contaminants in the space, you can get rid of them um, prior to the next shift, prior to the next occupancy level. So the third pillar of IEQ mitigation that, that we've been talking to our customers with is contain. Um, this is a little bit less understood, I think, than the other um, pillars, and it's probably the least used, but it's about humidity control. So why do we care about humidity? It, it seems like that seems very secondary. Well, it's been well known for quite some time that viruses are more stable at low humidity levels than they are at higher humidity levels. Um, the typical sweet spot has been 40 to 60% relative humidity. The SARS-CoV-2 virus that, that causes COVID-19 is no different. If you have 25% relative humidity at 75 at 70 degrees, you're going to have about 50 times the amount of active virus remaining after five hours than if your space is at 50% relative humidity. Um, so if you're in, I'm in La Crosse, Wisconsin, it was minus five degrees this morning. My house wasn't necessarily all that humid. It was pretty dry. So you have to make sure that you maintain humidity levels if you have a high occupancy rate. But the one thing you don't want to do is you want to go. You don't want to go too high in humidity because then you can start talking about bringing in other nasties that get generated with high humidity. The last thing you want to do in a building is set your get your relative humidity up to eighty percent because then you start having mold, fungus issues, some types of bacteria, and even some other types of viruses. Not not SARS CoV two, but other types of viruses actually grow at that higher humidity level. So. 40 to 60% is really that sweet spot for humidity in order to reduce risk. And then finally, we're gonna talk about the last of our mitigation pillars and that's cleaning. Um, cleaning is kind of where everybody up to now, um, that along with dilution, they've focused on that because cleaning is really about attacking that contaminant. And everybody likes to go on the offense here. We don't always wanna play defense, we wanna go on the offense. And I'll turn it over to Jeff, but the one thing that you need to remember is based upon the type of building, you may need to use combinations of all these mitigation strategies to reduce the contaminant to the level that you want in a building. So I'll hand it over to Jeff to talk more about how you meet IAQ goals with these type of technologies uh, that we call cleaning technologies. Jeff. Great, thank you, Ron. Uh, so uh, before we get into the different technologies, um, just want to talk about a little bit of work that we have done over the last couple of years. Um, when the pandemic came on early 2020, uh, there was a lot of, um, I guess, confusion around uh, different technologies and how well they work on different uh, parameters of indoor air quality. Um, and a lot of that, I think, was, was a result of not having uh, an, an accepted standard for testing these different technologies, right? So you see some, some companies would test their uh, technologies a certain way in a certain size chamber, and we'd see other technologies being tested, you know, differently, right? And uh, the test chambers we'd see anywhere from one, you know, cubic foot, uh, and companies would take the results and try to extrapolate those out to what it, the impact would be in a full building. Um, you know, some were 36 cubic feet and so on. Uh, really, 
not a lot of testing done in, in large chambers that were similar to intended use. Uh, so with the lack of a standard and, and not really being able to compare results of one technology versus another, we wanted to conduct our own testing. Um, you know, at the time, ASHRAE recommended um, independent third-party testing to validate uh, any claims being made, and so we wanted to follow those guidelines. Uh, we worked with a company called LMS Technologies up in the Midwest, and uh, working with Kevin Kwong and Kathleen Owen. So both, uh, I think, are pretty um, well-known folks. They're both part of ASHRAE. Uh, Kathleen's on the ASHRAE Epidemic Task Force, and so Kevin would, would perform the tests, and Kathleen would help with uh, analyzing the data and then send us back the results. And, and the intent of our testing was not to get absolute performance. What we really wanted to do was to get back-to-back -back comparisons of different technologies on different factors. Um, really two types of equipment we looked at. One was induct, so I think filtration uh, and, and other equipment that would be in, a, in an air handler or in a duct. Uh, and the second group of technologies were in-room technologies, so in-room HEPA filters and, and you know, bipolar ionization claims to, to, to react in the space and, and technologies like that. Um, and then as far as the contaminants we wanted to test, uh, obviously the viruses were, you know, and still are a big deal. So we wanted to look at virus efficacy. Uh, we wanted to look at bacteria efficacy as well, both on surfaces and in the air. Um, in addition to you know, pathogens, uh, we wanted to look at VOC removal, understanding that, you know, with IEQP, um, if you can reduce VOCs, you can reduce outside air. That's obviously gonna be important as we get back past the pandemic. Um, in addition to VOCs, we also want to look at particulate matter. And with all of this testing, we want to look at byproduct generation. So specifically ozone, we know there's been a lot of attention with ozone lately, but uh, also look at other you know, VOCs that may come out of the product and, and other uh, potential contaminants. Um, so, so what we, uh, like I said, what we did, we worked with LMS. At the time, they had the largest uh, chamber we could find. So at the time, it was 1,007 a, a cubic feet. Uh, they've since built a 4,100 cubic foot chamber that we're continuing to do testing in. So uh, again, an e even larger chamber. Um, in this chamber, mixing vans, and we had a bypass duct set up, you can see with the blue. So it really took air from one side and, and uh, moved it around and put it back in the other side of the space. Uh, this allowed us to look at impact of air changes per hour on different technologies, and we could vary the amount of air flowing through the, the bypass duct. Um, and, and you can see where the sampling happened, where the contaminants were, were injected in the space and where the, where the different uh, probes were to, to measure. Uh, based off all of our testing, this is just a, a kind of a high level um, relative performance chart that, that we published out there. Uh, it really shows how different technologies compared to each other. So we start, <clears throat> we'll start with MERV 13, which is uh, the fifth column uh, in the chart. Why MERV-13? When, when ASHRAE came out with their recommendations, they recommended using MERV-13 filters or MERV-13 equivalent performance with other technologies. And so that's really our, our kind of baseline or, or standard we want to evaluate everything against is MERV-13 performance. Um, now you can see that we tested bipolar ionization. That was a UL-867 device. And so it did allow some ozone generation. It wasn't the ozone-free uh, devices that are out there now. Uh, we looked at dry hydrogen peroxide, so tested some synexus units, um, photocatalytic oxidation device, and then also UVGI lights, right? And, and the UV lights we looked at were a URB19, I think is a bit higher than what's being recommended. At the time, there wasn't a lot of guidance around it, so we, we wanted to ensure we had enough UV lights to um, uh, in our test. And then looking at in-room devices, again, we had an, an in-room dry hydrogen peroxide device and then an in-room HEPA product. And, and overall, what we found um, they all were pretty effective at reducing airborne pathogens. Um, you can see relative performance, some work better than others. Um, well, another interesting finding that we found is that really only one worked on surface reduction of pathogens, and those were the dry hydrogen peroxide devices. Uh, despite some of the claims we've seen from other technologies, our testing did not show any impact on surface contaminants. In addition to that, we did not see any impact on VOCs except for the dry hydrogen products. Uh, try dry hydrogen peroxide products as well. Um, so definitely learned a lot here. I think we put out some, some white papers uh, that talk in a little more detail about our testing, but with this new set of data, now we can make better decisions. So when we're going in and looking, you know, we talk about the assessment of a building, there's definitely the, the traditional technologies available, right? The ventilation, filtration, changing MERV levels, and UVGI, which have all been widely accepted. Um, Traditional technologies work well. A lot of times they can also significantly increase energy costs in the space, right? So 
a lot of outside air. Um, it's expensive to, to treat the air to be, you know, the right temperature and right humidity coming in the space. Um, filtration, a lot of customers moving from MERV 8 to MERV 13, um, uh, you know, stresses out their HVAC equipment. If it can handle the pressure drop, some can't at all. Uh, and then the UVGI lights, you know, that's just a, another component. You can now, we can now we have the data to look at some of these emerging technologies. How can we pair these emerging technologies with traditional technologies to achieve the desired outcome at the same time we can start to balance efficacy with efficiency so if we can do a combination get that MERV 13 performance or better and do it with less energy right that's optimal for the customer um again i think uh, we hit it earlier it's, it's never going to be a single product we're not ever going to say hey go put this in and it's going to solve all your problems it's going to be a system of of uh, a, a system or a solution uh, approach it's going to be um combining two three four different technologies that uh, can be operated differently to achieve different results. Uh, the last piece I'll, I'll bring up is when considering different technologies to use, I think we need to go back to you know EPA, CDC, and ASHRAE recommendations. I talked a second ago about ozone. There has been a lot of um, discussions around ozone lately. We know ozone um, can oxidize pathogens and it can oxidize VOCs, and so it can be effective at, at helping mitigate um, uh, you know, get some of these contaminants, but at the same time, we know ozone is also a toxin. And so, you know, as studies and research has come out, right, there's been recommendations to start going towards ozone-free devices. And so the EPA, CDC, and ASHRAE all recommend uh, using UL2998 um, rated products. And so UL2998 is uh, claiming it's a zero ozone uh, generation from the device. It allows for five parts per billion or less. Um, there is a UL867 they call low ozone, uh, that's 50 parts per billion, but the recommendation is to go for the more stringent UL2998. Um, in addition to uh, UL2998 technology, ASHRAE also wants to see, as I mentioned earlier, third-party independent test data validating any claims being made. Um, and then also data that shows the efficiency and, and safety of the technology under conditions consistent with the intended use. And so that really challenges extrapolating results from a 36 cubic foot box and, and implying that it's going to be safe in a larger setting. So just something to keep in mind as we're as we're designing these systems, does it meet the EPA, does it meet the CDC and ASHRAE guidance? Because that's what's really going to going to be uh, what's really going to matter to our customers at the end of the day. So with that, I think I'll turn it over to Scott to walk through um, our building automation systems. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so Scott Huffmaster here. Um, going to talk a little bit about the impact to automation systems and monitoring, uh, what we're seeing as market trends. So historically, we had traditional sensors that would tell us temperature, humidity, potentially. In some instances, we would be using CO2. Um, traditionally, we would use that data to do control sequences like demand control ventilation. Um, but a lot of this is of course based upon the premise of reducing energy use for the building. With the onset of the pandemic, we are learning that there's, and what we've already known, there are other things that we may want to consider when we're looking at the indoor air quality of a building versus those traditional focus. So as we move away from the traditional focus of temperature, humidity, CO2, and efficiency, what other things might we consider? So those growing needs would be looking at things like VOC concentration in the space that can lead to odors uh, or, other, or other challenges in a space. Uh, fine particulates, um, you could call that PM1, PM2.5, PM10. Uh, one that becomes more common in some of the commercially available sensors is that PM2.5. When we start talking about IEQ, uh, as you saw earlier in the, the presentation, IEQ involves more than just the indoor air quality and more than just thermal comfort. That involves understanding things like noise pollution and right and correct lighting levels. So we're now seeing sensors that will also monitor ambient lighting and ambient noise. Um, these advanced sensing solutions are giving us a way to better manage and validate the IAQ of a space. Instead of having just an instant of time, now we're able to see trends and really take data and do something with that data. Now, how might we share that information with the building occupant um, with, you know, again, with either the internal customer, the facility manager, or the external customer, the people that are coming in? Um, what we're seeing now is 
automation systems visualizing that, whether that's on the sensor itself with the score, like you saw on the previous slide. Uh, it could be a dashboard that you're putting on your automation system. Sometimes that's just going to be on the automation system itself. At times, we even see that put as a kiosk. You put that into a kiosk as a person comes into a building, and you can actually earn points for doing things like that in certain rating systems like Well or FitWell. Another thing that you can see is, what if we've got some variable conditions, right? So it's not always just the data that you're seeing inside the building that might lead to a decision for how you control your system. It could be also other data. Um, think about, again, we're in a pandemic today. Um, pandemic means, the way ASHRAE terms it, epidemic conditions in place. So what if we've got systems where we can, we can balance taking different action if we have different metrics leading to that? So if case rates are high, you know, and even as we get to endemic, if flu cases are high or COVID becomes endemic this coming fall of 2022 and we start to see case rates go up, wouldn't it be great if we could toggle our system from focusing on optimizing around energy use and instead, we're going to have enhanced IAQ mode. So if you see in the bottom left of that little picture there, you'll see a little green button says enhanced IAQ mode. That means the ability to toggle our system into an epidemic conditions in place, bringing in as much outside air as possible, um, running your systems longer. Again, prioritizing the, the health of a space as opposed to the energy efficiency. This is something we're seeing sensors allowing us to do. Now with that, I'm kind of touching on something that I think many of you on this call recognize. IAQ and a focus on IAQ and even IEQ is leading to a new look at how we design the systems themselves. There are, on the left here, you'll see common things that we're seeing as parts of how we deliver on IAQ in a building. Um, Mervade is a baseline. That's a standard 62.1 requirement for any coil that has a wetted surface. You might be surprised to know there are systems that are put in today that at times are not even using a Mervate filter. And that shouldn't be happening. If you're doing a system that can't do a Mervate, you need to decouple your sensible and latent loads so that you're not creating a wetted coil in those systems. Merv 13 is a very core recommendation. We hear it all the time. We've heard it throughout the pandemic but not all systems can handle MERV-13 pressure drop. HEPA, yeah, HEPA is great, but again, can your system handle that pressure drop? UVGI, core recommendation, talked about the contained pillar, dehumidification and humidification, getting into that right range. Airside economizing, that's again, the dilute pillar. Precision ventilation, you heard earlier, disable demand control ventilation when we're not in pandemic mode or epidemic conditions in place. That doesn't mean that when we reach endemic and we're no longer in this, this mode, that we shouldn't be using a CO2 reading to provide precision ventilation so that we can get back to optimizing energy. So don't mistake that disabled demand control ventilation to say that you shouldn't be including that in your designs. Uh, we still wanna use CO2 when we can. Um, the last place is to do these high level modes like the epidemic conditions in place, IAQ optimization, You've got to have integrated controls to really deliver on that. So what I want to call out now, as we think about the aspects of a system design that we would ideally have, from a general statement, how well can different system types handle these recommendations? So really what I'm showing here is whether you're looking at an applied system, a light commercial unitary, a large unitary system, or maybe a VRF system with a dedicated outside air, outside air unit, the capabilities of adding these, these uh, modes and these abilities really vary based on system type. As you'll notice, an applied system allows a whole lot of variability in what we can deliver to a space. A lower cost light commercial unitary system is going to have some struggles with that. HEPA, for instance, we show as a red dot because to my knowledge, there's not a standard off the shelf rooftop unit they can handle the pressure drop of a HEPA added without some form of a fan modification. Most often, if you have a light commercial system and you wanted HEPA, it'd probably be a portable you put in the space and it wouldn't be designed into the system. That's just an example. One other piece I wanna call out here 
is really thinking about how this guidance can impact system designs and numbers don't always tell the whole story. What do I mean by numbers don't tell the whole story? For some quick comparison, let's consider either upping our filtration centrally at an air handling unit to a MERV 14 filter, and let's compare that to a system where I put a MERV 13 out in the space. So we're gonna put it in a distributed system. What's an example of a distributed system? Let's say a series fan power box, um, something served with a DOAS, where you've got that out in the space. Now, one would think if I have a MERV 14, that's better than MERV 13. But if you actually do a comparison, and what this is pulled from is a, a tool from ASHRAE called the Effective Outdoor Air or Effective Air Change Calculator. And this is a way of calculating how many effective air changes am I getting, and it gives you credit for the filter. So if you notice, the centralized MERV 14, I'm at 50% supply airflow. A lot of our systems are gonna be designed for minimum airflow in a VAV box to turn down at least 50%. That's a code requirement. But what if I've got a terminal unit that's a constant volume of air, like a series fan powered box, and I'm able to retrofit that or maybe purchase it from the factory with the MERV 13? Well, believe it or not, when I'm able to do MERV 13 in the space, I'm getting almost a 90% increase in effective air changes. Effective air changes, the amount of clean air in the space, because I'm putting a lot more air through a MERV 13. And even though the MERV 13 may provide slightly less removal than the MERV 14, filtration is very dependent upon the amount of air you put through the filter. So this is just something to consider. I'm gonna share one other piece here. Of, think about what might be a, a system you would consider if your customer asked you for, give me the latest and greatest, best design you can think of for delivering on IEQ in a space. What I'm gonna, going to suggest to you is consider a system like a sensible cooling terminal unit system. What is a sensible cooling terminal unit system, Mr. Huffmaster? What this is, is we're essentially combining a lot of the, the uh, design aspects of a chill beam system where you've got a sensible loop serving the space with a DOAS system that is also doing precision control. So if you think of a, of a chill beam system that's gonna have recirculated air from the space, that air is gonna get pulled through using a series uh, fan through a sensible coil, and in this example showing a sensible only cooling coil, and it's gonna supply that to the space consistently. We, can, we would have a filter upstream of that, we have the ability to, to get that as high as a MERV 13 filter if that's going to be what the space needs. This also has built into it essentially a cooling only VAV box. But what's gonna control that is both occupancy and CO2 readings for the space. So we can optimize how much ventilation we're gonna to bring to the space based on that CO2 reading. The other piece to this is these systems are designed to have humidity sensors and we're going to watch very closely the latent loads in the space so we can reset the dehumidification levels from our DOAS unit. They are decoupled sensible and latent designs. That, that drip pan there uh, is actually not piped because it's going to have just a sensor. So if you really review a system like this, now you've got this system that can really deliver on a lot of these things. There's some big cost advantages to it. And again, just, uh, just something to consider, designs like this can achieve a lot of points, whether it's lead, whether it's well, fit well, while also meeting a lot of these IAQ and IEQ goals that you're going to hear from ASHRAE, CDC, and EPA. There are a lot of other systems we could certainly dive into, but again, in the interest of time, just wanted to bring up one of the prime systems you might consider for IEQ. With that, I'm going to hand back over to Jeff Wiseman to wrap us up. Awesome. Thanks, Scott. So I know we just went through um, a bunch of information. I think we're really just scratching the surface here. So um, uh, definitely a lot more we can share. But I think just some of the key takeaways. Uh, we know buildings are going to continue to be dynamic spaces that are going to require, you know, variability in, um, in conditioning these spaces, right? And, you know, that's especially true, you know, you consider the whole work at home, 
trend that's going on? Will we have full occupancy? When does that shift back to having a full house? And do we have everything designed to handle uh, those large variations? Um, in, in addition to um, you recognizing that, I think also uh, what we are hearing, you know, loud and clear from customers is the need to balance efficacy with efficiency. So early on in the pandemic, uh, ASHRAE came out with recommendations, um, you know, 100% outside air all the time, um, exhaust fans running all the time, MERV 13 filtration. And we've heard this is, you know, customers can do this at you know, some pretty big energy penalties, right? We hear about electric bills going up 30, 40%, sometimes even 100% to meet the recommendations um, for the pandemic, um, this isn't sustainable, right? And you think some customers that are on fixed budgets like schools or, or um, you know, other, other uh, vertical markets, you know, they're just not gonna be able to do that year after year uh, without big changes to their budgets. And so we're gonna need to have the ability to still ensure that we've got a safe space, but we can do it as energy efficiently as possible. Um, you know, technology is going to continue to change in advance. We know uh, there's new standards being developed to test technology. We're hearing about new technologies um, on a regular basis, right? So I think recommendations and learnings are going to continue to evolve over time. And, and uh, it's exciting, right? We're going to find better ways to treat contaminants and do it more efficiently. Um, and just finally, Scott kind of hit on it. The proper system design is going to be critical to achieving these goals. Uh, we need to have the flexibility in our system to, to handle all of these changing variables. Uh, so it's, it's important to think about that when looking at, you know, current buildings and changes we're going to make or designing new buildings. Um, so I guess with that, uh, Amara, we'll hand it over to you to um, wrap us up. All right. Excellent. Thank you. That was a lot of information. And now our three trained presenters will answer questions from the audience. Please type your questions for the presenters in the ask a question box on your screen and we'll get to as many questions as time allows. Questions that we do not get to today will be posted online at www.csemag.com. That's csemag.com. It will be posted with the archived version of this webcast. And as a reminder, you can download a certificate of completion or a copy of this presentation as a PDF in the event resources tab on the left side of your screen. All right, gentlemen, we have a lot to get to here. Let's try to tackle as many as possible. Uh, Scott, I'm gonna send the first question to you. What's your opinion on additional filtration systems for pathogens, uh, you know, using things like UVC, bipolar ionization, uh, what's your take on those? So if we're talking about additional, and I, just to clarify that, I would assume that that would mean in addition to the existing equipment that's in place. So what I would suggest there is evaluating uh, long-term need and is that a best use? Uh, if asked, does train uh, support or, or contradict, for instance, uh, the use of portable HEPA filters? Portable HEPAs have been, become very, very common uh, through the, throughout the pandemic. And you could probably find a recording of me suggesting that maybe there's a better way, not suggesting a portable HEPA won't help. But if we're moving from pandemic to endemic, um, I have a concern how many of those are going to end up in landfills in the next two years. I hate to say that, but think about that. Ask yourself that question for something that's portable. Will that become disposable? If your, if your space truly is that high risk and should be treated, why would we not design something that's going to be permanent, that's going to be energy efficient, that can be properly controlled, that won't have somebody unplugging it or turning it down, undermining its efficacy? I think I got a little bit of passion around that one. So <laughs> hopefully that's an okay answer there, Mark. Yeah, sounds like you have a lot of passion. Thank you very much. Uh, Jeff, this next question is for you. The current OSHA standard for DHP in air is one part per million for an eight hour work shift. Um, how do products make sure that occupants aren't exposed to too much? Yeah, it's a great question. And we've seen a number of products that uh, claim to make uh, gaseous hydrogen peroxide or use vaporized hydrogen peroxide to treat the space. And so um, when looking at 
we'll start with the vaporized. So that's boiling an aqueous solution. That's typically, you know, a mix of hydrogen peroxide and water. Um, concentrations of hydrogen peroxide can get very high, right? So not safe for occupied mm -hmm. space and not what we tested um, in our testing. Um, the units we tested make very low uh, concentrations of hydrogen peroxide. So it's making it truly in the gaseous form using um, water molecules, humidity and, and oxygen in the space and, and, um, and converting it to hydrogen peroxide. And, and we're talking, you know, parts per billion, single parts per billion concentrations. And so significantly below the OSHA safety limits uh, for um, uh, hydrogen peroxide. Um, in addition, why do we pick Synexis? They've got seven peer reviewed studies out around their, their technology, right? So a lot of these come from the healthcare space, um, hospitals using hydrogen peroxide, some pretty sensitive areas of the hospital, like pedi pediatric oncology wards and so on, um, in showing uh, a, they're effective at, at keeping the uh, cleaning air and, and also surfaces, contaminants on uh, surfaces like bed curtains and stuff that, that don't typically get clean. Uh, but B, which is really important, the safety, no adverse impacts of the hydrogen peroxide in the air. And we can get into a lot more detail. Um, you know, our lungs make hydrogen peroxide as well. So it's, it's not a foreign chemical that we're introducing to the air that we're breathing in. But uh, we've done a lot of research over the last year and a half or so to ensure we're not introducing another contaminant uh, while we're addressing, you know, initial contaminants in the space. All right. Very good. Thank you. Ron, the next question is for you. Um, can you comment on the effect of indoor ventilation systems on the spread of respiratory particles? Sure. So there's, at the very beginning of the pandemic, um, when it first came out, there were some um, studies done on specific rooms, including a small restaurant in Wuhan, China, that specifically saw the spread of, of COVID-19 through in, in this restaurant with indoor air conditioning. Now, in this case, this indoor air conditioner did not have any dilution effect. It didn't have any outside air coming in. But what it did is it spread air and subsequently the air that was flowing in the room went past a person that was infected. And the Chinese government found through that study that that person's location in the room, based with that fan, it sent the respiratory droplets from that infected person through the air to the rest of the room. And you could see a flow pattern within that room that showed air does impact, does carry droplets, respiratory droplets that may contain the virus that causes infection to other people. So ventilation and airflow will move those respiratory droplets around a space such that it can infect other people. So one of the things, and there was another question in the chat around, can it be transmitted by airflow versus just respiratory droplets? Well, doesn't matter what type of, well, if you take a look at influenza, influenza, when somebody has the flu, when they breathe, they're actually emitting droplets that contain that virus. How long they may sit next to somebody, how close they are, that provides a viral load to that person that's next to them. And depending on how high that viral load is, that depends whether or not you get sick, how, how high the viral load is and how long you sit there. So the reason the pandemic has really been so hard hitting is one, it's a harsh virus from what you get from an infection standpoint, but especially as we look at the current variant it doesn't take that much viral load that you intake to really get you infected. Um, but every person as they breathe, they're, you're actually exuding droplets that may be on the order of three microns and smaller. The virus size is on the order of 100 nanometers. So depending on where you sit and how long you sit there, you could be in the presence of that. What you can do, and that's what we wanted to talk about around the IAQ mitigation pillars is if you bring in outside air, that it replaces the air that's in there. So you're minimizing the amount of potential virus there by replacing it with outside clean air. If you do humidity control, if you have less humidity, those droplets, those water droplets that the virus may reside in, if they start evaporating, they get smaller, which means they hang up in the air longer, which is what you don't want. You want that virus not only from a half-life to go away, but you also don't want it to hang up in the air where you could breathe it in. So humidity is not just about half-life of a virus. It's also about 
keeping that droplet large so it eventually will drop out of the air. And then finally, you have cleaning technologies. If you have something in your ventilation system that's a cleaning technology or something in your room that's a cleaning technology, that can help prevent that. So it's not just about ventilation. It's about this whole package. And so that's why we've been trying to tell people there's different mitigation policies here or mitigation strategies that you can use. Sure. Vital information. Thank you. All right, Scott, the next question is for you. Um, could the sensible cooling terminal units be considered to be providing simultaneous heating and cooling, which would be a violation of the energy code? Can you talk a little bit about that? So, yeah, sensible terminal unit works similarly to any other system where you've got the system separated. So what do I mean there? The, the energy code about energy recovery is really more focused on, let's say, a rooftop unit and the need to recapture heat for hot gas reheat, uh, as opposed to relying fully on terminal heating. Now, any larger system where you've got centrally located chillers serving an air handler that then serves a VAV box, and that VAV box is using electric heat or hot water heat or fan powered box to provide some of the heat. Um, if, if, if there was an issue with the sensible terminal unit, there would be an issue with every one of those applied systems. So that does not apply in this instance. Now, what I would say as well is it's not uncommon for the, the sensible terminal unit um, to utilize heat recovery. Um, one of the benefits to those systems is we can use cooler hot water, which expands the, the, um, the number of products that we can use uh, for the, the sensible water generation. When you're making 57 degree cool water, chilled water, uh, it's a little bit easier to make 120 degree hot water uh, to actually recover heat, as an example. Okay, great example, thank you. Uh, Jeff, this next question is for you. This is kind of a broad question. Um, outdoor air quality could be suspect in some cities or populated areas. How do you make the fresh air fresher? Absolutely. Good, good question. And we've, um, we've seen that quite a bit, especially here lately, right, with the wildfires. Um, they're bringing in outside air, right? Could you be bringing in contaminants, part, particulate matter and VOCs that can make your indoor air quality worse? Uh, there are technologies that are available that can be uh, incorporated with a dedicated outdoor air system to help clean the outdoor air. Um, and again, depending on what you're looking for, if it's uh, particulate matter, you got a lot of dust, that could be, you know, better filtration um, solutions. If, it, if it's VOCs like smoke, right, there are technologies that are very effective at reducing VOCs. Uh, so depending on the outdoor air quality concerns in that region or in that location, uh, solutions absolutely can be uh, incorporated to help address those those concerns. Um, the last piece, you know, uh, you know, in, in addition to you know treating the outside air, right? We can also look at, um, you know, can you reduce outside air and and improve your indoor air quality by implementing other technologies? So, uh, you, you know, that's another option that's available. Um, I, there's some questions around <clears throat> controls and how do you monitor, right? So if, if you can monitor VOCs in the space and CO2 and other parameters, that allows you to to um, to react to contaminants in, in your in your space and cycle on solutions to help address those contaminants. The the one that's a, a challenge of CO2, obviously, right? And not many products can can help reduce CO2, so ventilation really is is key. Here. We don't ever want to say eliminate ventilation completely, but you know, again, every situation is is different. Really need to understand the issues in that certain environment, and then we can absolutely develop solutions to help address those um, those issues. Very good, thank you. Uh, let's see here, Ron. A question for you, and this is a crystal ball question. So, shine <laughs> yours. Get make, make sure you're ready. Um, have there been any changes to the standard of care for IAQ to address the current and future pandemics? And then the next question is, what are we looking at in the future to address ongoing pandemics or future pandemics? Oh, that's a that's a big question. Um, 
I'll say the one thing that's been kind of hindsight in this pandemic, I've been involved in, I got involved in IEQ back in 2011, 2012, uh, when trains started looking at things after the H1N1 pandemic. Uh, unfortunately, there wasn't pull for that from our customers. And so we kind of, hindsight, we went away from it because we didn't see that pull. Um, but looking to what's happened in this pandemic, as soon as the pandemic got up to the, to the scope that we knew this was gonna be big, we realized there were a lot of knowledge gaps around how to compare these technologies, cleaning technologies against each other, and then even to look to see how they would compare to dilution. And so Scott showed some of that in terms of equivalent air exchange rates, that one of the reasons we did this comparative testing is there's no common test standard between different cleaning technologies. And so one of the things that we're looking forward to in the future for our industry is how do you compare these different cleaning technologies against each other? And how do they compare against dilution, against what you can do for humidity control um, and, and what you can do for exhaust control? So it's kind of, you can build models around this based upon common standard tests that allow you to do this. Right now, if you go look at online about these different technologies, everybody tests them a different way. Um, there's not a common consistent test methodology. And so we see that as being one of the next steps that has to get developed in our industry is a common methodology to test, to compare technologies, to make it so that people understand, understand the efficacy better. Um, so I, I think that's the next step. And I think even part of it was uh, somebody asked in the chat also as well as, hey, it's great that you showed us relative comparison of the technologies. What's the true efficacy? Well, that efficacy is for one type of room, for one size, and for a certain airflow. So we can give you percentages. But again, to Jeff's comment, all buildings are different. So airflow exchange rates may be different. So we can give you some of those percentage removal numbers. You can, in fact, you can just go out and, and Google train IAQ white paper. And there's a couple of white papers out there that you can go to immediately and see the percentage of uh, microbiologicals that were removed in our testing. <laughs> but that's just for that room. So we like to look at things more from a, a, you've got a relative comparison between these technologies. So that's the next step is to go, What's that test standard? And we need to have that developed. All right, some great resources there. Thank you. Um, looks like we have time for one more question. Scott, I'm gonna send this one your way. Okay. Um, so we're talking about energy efficiency in IAQ or IEQ. Uh, what's mm -hmm. the strategy to maintain energy efficiency when you're trying to do all of these things to improve air quality and environmental quality? Uh, great question. So, and kind of a lot of our responses have been, it depends. Uh, I will start by saying uh, one approach to reducing energy impact as you focus on IAQ is, is maybe following, let's say the IAQP procedure under 62.1. Uh, I want to go on record that that's, there's technologies that are popular for that. Uh, one that we don't support today would be the use of non-ozone generating bipolar ionization to supplant ventilation. We went on record with that in our white paper about a year ago uh, that Ron Cosby mentioned. So you can read our statement and why we made that statement. So we're not using that technology to supplant ventilation, which would thereby save energy. So instead, we need to get more creative with how we do that. So how do we get more creative? Being able to provide precision ventilation, being able to utilize energy recovery, making sure we're not overventilating but not underventilating, using air cleaning technologies that could be as simple as filtration improvements, improvement from a MERV 8 to a MERV 13. While that may use a little bit more energy, that can be offset by getting more efficient equipment to provide a, a healthier, safer space. At the highest level, you've got to have the technology and the communication using the sensors to communicate to the controls. The controls then can allow for complex, complex routines to deliver on that precision control. Uh, again, all of those things play into each other, right? And I would challenge that 
most of you on this call probably know what I'm talking about. You know how to design more efficient systems. So let's all do that together. Wow, a lot of great information and a lot of great questions to help elaborate on this information. Kudos to our speakers today, Jeff Wiseman, Scott Huffmaster, and Ron Cosby for sharing their time and expertise. And I'd also like to extend a special thanks to our sponsor, Train, for sponsoring today's event. And now that we are just about done, we want to hear how we did. The exit survey will pop up on your screen as soon as this webcast ends. Please take a moment to complete it because we do use this information to improve future webcasts. Finally, on behalf of Consulting Specifying Engineer and CFE Media and Technology, I'd like to thank you for attending. This now concludes our webcast. Thank you and goodbye.